Hi, I'm Barney Schwenke, the pastor here of Faithway Baptist Church in Leesburg. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to watch this sermon video we're about to show you. My prayer is that God will use this message, along with you being part of a local Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, to help you grow in your walk with the Lord. Trust that the following message will be a blessing to your heart. Bibles this morning, 1 Kings chapter 19 is our text. Children through the age of fourth grade, you're dismissed for Children's Church of Miss Laurie out the back door. And uh, we have some exciting announcements coming down the pike as far as Children's Church goes. So stay tuned after the service is over today. During our announcement time, parents of little kids, you're going to be especially interested in this. And uh, we are thankful for what the Lord is doing because our church uh, is growing and that's a good thing. And lots of little kids running around, and so we've had to make some changes to our classes. And so we really are thankful to the Lord for growth. That's a good thing. Last year when COVID hit, we really had no idea what the future would hold. And I think a lot of us kind of were say, okay, Lord, whatever your will is, let it be. And um, through it all, God has strengthened the church, and uh, he's brought people to faith. And people have joined our church in spite of everything. And so we are thankful for what God is certainly doing here. We're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 19 today, and our text is verses 5 through 8. And you say, well, I thought we looked at this last week, and we did. But really what I'd like to do is go back and not re-preach the same message from last Sunday, but look at it from a different perspective. Because many times in life, we will look at things, you know, you, it, it depends, you witness an accident, right? You talk to a police officer, you see it from the north side, or you see it from the south side, you see different things. And today I'd like to look at this text and specifically delve into verses 5 through 8, and look at the phrase that God uses here, arise and eat. This morning we're going to see God's abundant grace in the life of Elijah. Thus, the theme of our songs, and even the song that Kristen sang, Come to Christ, and He will give you the grace and the strength that you need to make you whole. Elijah, in a very real sense, is a picture of the New Testament woman at the well, that Samaritan woman. He was wandering, and he was thirsty, and his soul needed something that only God could satisfy. And we're going to see that here in our text this morning. Let's read verses 5 through 8 together. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse number 5. The Bible says this, and he, that's Elijah, lay and slept under a juniper tree. By the way, the juniper tree in Bible days was probably the most useless tree in the desert. Uh, some of you may know your trees, and you know that in northern Virginia there's an invasive species. It's called a Russian olive tree. If you've ever seen that before, uh, our, the house we lived at in Lovettsville had a little creek at the bottom of the hill, and they tend to gravitate, Russian olives do, they're not native to northern Virginia, they're from Europe and Asia, and uh, thus the name, and they just grow like crazy and they spread. That's kind of the juniper tree here. There's no point to this tree other than providing a little bit of shade in the desert. There was really nothing that the people of God, Israel, would ever gather from it that they could really use. And uh, the angel of the Lord touched him under that juniper tree. In verse 5, Behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water on his, at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb. The Mount of God. Father, as we dig into your word this morning, your Holy Spirit is our teacher. And so we ask you that uh, he would do a work in our hearts that I cannot do as a pastor, Lord, that no other human being can do. It's got to be the Holy Spirit of God moving in our midst. And so for that, Lord, we pray. Help us to see and hear and understand what you're saying to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, last time we saw Elijah, he's there under the juniper tree. And as I mentioned, very few people have anything good to say about juniper trees. But Elijah's there, he's discouraged. And when he sees himself there in verses 5 through 8, with Elijah underneath that tree, he's a man running from Jezebel for his life, and he is afraid and he is only looking at his circumstances. If you and I were to take the spiritual temperature of this guy by the name of Elijah at this point in his life, we would say that Elijah is backslidden. If I use that word, do you know what, what that means, right? A backslidden Christian, that's not necessarily a biblical word, but a backslidden Christian is someone that is not walking with God as they ought to be. 
Maybe they haven't been in church in a long, long time. They don't read their Bible. They don't pray like they ought. They are Christians, but they're not living like they are Christians. All right, so that's a backslidden Christian. And that was what, that's where Elijah would be at this point. Here's a man of God that was used mightily just a week or so before, or actually a couple of days before. He's there, and God allowed him to, to kill 450 false prophets, a marvelous display of the power of God, and yet we find him under the juniper tree, very confused, to the point where he's falling asleep. And when we look at our own circumstances, when we don't turn to Jesus Christ in the midst of our problems, we have the tendency, like Elijah, to grow lethargic as well, spiritually. And ladies and gentlemen, the further we run from the good shepherd, the more lax and the more drowsy we will become spiritually, and we will feel dead and we will feel barren inside. Has anybody here ever been there? My hand is up, okay? I've been there before, and I'm sure many of you here in this room have. If you haven't, either you're a super Christian or you haven't been saved for very long. And I think most of us, we've been saved for a while. So we know what it's like to walk with God and experience times of barrenness. And when he's asleep, Elijah thinks that he's alone, but he's really not alone. Look at verse number five again. It's on the screen. And he lay and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat so here's elijah thinking that he's all by himself he sent his servant away remember we saw that last week he thinks he's all by himself in the desert but the lord followed elijah into the desert and when elijah thought he was making his own path god was right behind him ladies and gentlemen do you know what we call that god pursuing us in our deserts we call that grace God's gift to us that he doesn't give up on pursuing us even though we deserve nothing but his nothing but the wrath of God God's amazing grace that he would pursue runaways like Elijah like Jonah like Peter and like you and like me and for 70 miles in an arid desert Elijah is running away from his problems, but he cannot run away from his great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says there in verse number five, the angel of the Lord follows him for 70 miles. And even though Elijah is not worthy to be followed, right? He's unworthy. Jesus follows him. Ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly what Jesus said in, in the gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 19, verse number 10, Jesus said this, for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you still have a pulse and you are still breathing oxygen, I want you to understand this morning that while you are alive, God is pursuing you. And you may be here this morning thinking, I can outrun God. I can just, you know, I can do my time and I can live my life in a good way. I don't need to trust Christ and be born again. I don't need to do those things. God will be relentlessly pursuing you until you bow the knee and say, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. He is coming after you. That's what the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was the modus operandi of Jesus when he was here on this earth, right? Come and see who I am. That was his job. But we go back to Elijah here in 1 Kings 19. And he's laying there under a juniper tree. He's in the way of disobedience. And while he is running from the will of God, the Bible says there in verse number five that the angel touched him. You see, it doesn't say that he slapped him. It doesn't say he hit him upside the head. It says he touched him. In the Hebrew there, that word is it's a very tender word. Right? Elijah, arise and eat. Beloved, that is God's amazing grace once again. Not only do we see God's grace in pursuing backslidden Christians, but we see it in coming and preparing a meal for Elijah in the midst of his wilderness. You see, when God speaks, he brings everything with him. We lack nothing when God is present. But he does one more thing. He says, Elijah, arise. And he says, arise and eat. Now, next Sunday morning, we're going to be having the Lord's Supper here at Faithway. And the invitation is going to go out to you, right? Come and dine. Arise and eat. Even if you're spiritually drowsy, we're going to have the Lord's Supper. And we're going to say to you, drowsy Christians, get right with God. It's an opportunity for you to repent of your sin and to come into a right relationship with the Lord. We're going to say a merciful invitation from God. Arise and eat. But you say, Pastor, I am so far away from being right with God. I, I, I can't. No, not right now. I just, I can't partake of the Lord's Supper. 
Do you know what the angel of the Lord would say to you in the midst of your backslidden condition? He would say the same thing he said to Elijah. Arise and eat. Here's why. You can't stay down indefinitely. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 21. I try to read the Proverbs every day, and this proverb has been stuck in my mind for many years now. Drowsiness shall clothe a man in rags. Now, that's talking about being lazy, right? So if you're a lazy person, you're not going to have a lot of money. You're going to be poor. You're always going to be asking other. If you refuse to go get a job, and you're always saying, help me, help me. I mean, that's the type of person Proverbs is talking about, right? Drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. But it is true spiritually as well. If you continue in your spiritual state, you will never get to that point. If you say, I'm just, I can't partake of the Lord's Supper, I can't repent of my sins, I can't tell God I'm sorry, then you're never going to get to a point where you have that relationship with God. But the angel of the Lord comes to you, and next Sunday we say to our church family, arise and eat. And you see in verse number six, Elijah did exactly what the angel of the Lord asked him to do. He ate and he drank of the meal that God had prepared for him. And that meal symbolizes in the Old Testament the Lord Jesus Christ. The coals that that meal was cooked on point to him. His sufferings. Think about what Jesus did for you on the cross. His death and that bread that is on the coals point to Jesus Christ as the bread of life. How do you make flour? Well, if you've ever seen the old grind mills, the old grist mills, they have a few that are around here. Um, not in operation anymore, but you go down to Aldi and there's a couple of others here in the area. They have these big stones that would be turned by power of, of, of the water. And the water would, would turn that big wheel and these stones would grind it and you would put the, the, the grain that you would pick and harvest from the field, you would put that on the rock and the rock would grind that into a fine powder and you would take that flour and you would mix it with a few other elements and then you would have bread. But in order to have bread, something has to be crushed. And so the Lord Jesus Christ enters into the millstone of the wrath of God. And on that old rugged cross, Jesus was crushed for us. And so here in our text, in verse number 5, Elijah, he's invited to eat and drink of him. The bread of life. And as Kristen sang this morning, the water of life. And so he arose and he ate. Now we would think at this point, Right? Elijah now sees the hand of God has followed him all this way and Elijah would be refreshed and he would now bow his knee in the desert and cry out to the Lord and say, God, I'm sorry that I acted this way. Lord, please forgive my fear of Jezebel. Please forgive my terrible prayer to die that he prayed earlier we saw last week. Lord, please just forgive me for my lack of faith. But that's not what happens. In verse number six, he laid him down again. The end of that verse, he fell asleep again. All right, just imagine for a moment, you're alone in the desert. No one is around you. You wake up and there's a meal that is prepared. You know someone is there, right? You're all by yourself in the middle of nowhere and there's food and coals and a fire. That had to come from somewhere. So Elijah, he eats and he drinks and he goes back to sleep. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, obviously Elijah partook of the food that was there he received nourishment and strength but i don't think he truly understood where it came from I, I, the reason i say that is because he if he got the fact that this was a meal prepared by god then i believe he would have bowed his knee and confessed his sin but god's people today we tend to act the same way we don't realize the value of what god has given to us we will sing a song on Sunday morning, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And we'll sing that song and we will never truly think about those words. I can guarantee you this, if you spend time meditating and thinking on the grace of God, it will bring tears to your eyes. When you think about the wretch that you are and God's grace and how it saved you, it will move you to the point in your heart, in your life, where you will have nothing but praise for Almighty God. And so, to whom much is given, much is required. We as Christians often act the same way because we don't appreciate God's grace. Now, it's not the angel's fault there in verse number 6 that Elijah went back to sleep. We understand that, that Elijah was a tired man. In fact, James chapter 5 tells us about Elijah, that he was a man of like passions as we are. In other words, he stumbled and he struggled just like you and just like me. And when Elijah failed to look to the master, his master, for strength, when he ate and when he drank, he wasn't doing it in remembrance of Jesus Christ. 
So next Sunday, we're going to have the Lord's Supper. And when we do, I guarantee you that there will be some people who are here in the auditorium that will walk away just as empty as when they came in. What will their problem be? They will eat and they will drink. The problem is they are not looking to Jesus. The, the problem will be they don't feel the nourishment and strength for the days and weeks to come because they fail to look at Jesus and, and they're only focused on themselves and they're only remembering themselves. And my friend, when we don't get beyond ourselves at the Lord's Supper, we don't do it rightly. There is no benefit spiritually for you and for me. And so the danger, and I'm going to warn you next Sunday before we partake of the Lord's Supper together, the danger is, well, if I don't get anything from the Lord's Supper, then I'm not going to participate ever again. You say, I don't deserve the Lord's Supper. And the answer is, absolutely, you are right. You do not. None of us ever do. None of us are worthy of the blessings of God. In fact, that's exactly why we come to the Lord's table. Precisely to identify the fact that we are unworthy and that we are far from where we need to be. And like Elijah, we say, God, I want to be left under my juniper tree, but God doesn't let us stay under that juniper tree. That's why he gives us the Lord's Supper as a time to remember all that he has done for us. And so just like Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. Here in our text, God was not only seeking Elijah, but God was pursuing Elijah. Now, if the angel had come to Elijah in verse number 5 and said, Elijah, I came 70 miles in the wilderness following you, and here you are sleeping again. Fine, I'm just going to leave you to your own life, your own sleep. Have a good rest of your life. Now, could you and I have blamed that angel for walking away in frustration after following Elijah for 70 miles, cooking him a meal, and getting absolutely no appreciation for it? No, we, we, we couldn't blame the angel. No way. But verse number 7, look at the, the Bible. The angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. In verse number 7, I read that verse, and I am thankful that God is a God who comes a second time. This is the beauty of the God of the Bible. He is relentless in his pursuit of his children. There's going to be a third time, and there will be a thousandth time, and there will be a hundred thousand time in our life that God will keep coming after you and after me. Beloved, there is always one more time that God will show his mercy. And if you really truly believe that, it will impact greatly how you live your life. If God is always willing to help us and forgive us once more, that means that we must be people that are willing to come to God one more time. Are you willing to come and see the grace of God? Remember what Jesus told Peter, right? Peter, the disciples come to him and said, Lord, if somebody offends me, how many times should I, uh, should I forgive them? And G Seven times? And Jesus said, no, what? Seventy times seven to infinity and beyond is essentially what Jesus said, right? It's forever and ever and ever. That's how many times you ought to forgive your brother. Why did Jesus say that? Here's the answer. Because God keeps forgiving us. God keeps persevering with us and pressing on after us. And so if God can do that for you and if he can do it for me, then we ought to be doing it for other people. People who don't deserve it. Sinners. H have you ever had... A child that annoyed you over and over and over again I, I i don't have children like that but i'm sure some of you may right over and over the question is asked repeatedly are we there yet are we there yet are, you, you get the idea or, or or someone comes to your house and maybe you're trying to help them and the thousandth time it happens right a thousand and one he does it again and you say that's it i'm done i've done my best i've tried i can't handle this anymore but my friend, God comes a second time. And I thank the Lord that he does. Otherwise, I would not be here this morning, and neither would you. God is a God of mercy. And Elijah should have been on the mountaintop preaching the word of God at this moment, but he's not there. He, he should have been preaching to the nation of Israel of the grace of God. But he's stuck in the wilderness 70 miles in the wrong direction. And here in this wilderness, the Bible tells us that the angel of the Lord provides a miraculous meal and even when elijah doesn't realize that this meal is from god he provides it anyways and then in verse number seven he does it again he provides another meal for him hear me this morning 
the fact that we are saved is amazing. But know what is more amazing? The fact that we stay saved. <laughs> he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That God would still come and have mercy on me. That, ladies and gentlemen, is love. How is it possible? How is it possible that God could have so much patience with me? Here's the reason. Because Jesus bore the sin of our inconsistency and our drowsiness. Where was that? At Gethsemane. Remember we talked about that last week? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. His best friends are a stone's throw away from him. And he says to them, can you not watch with me for an hour in prayer? Right? And his friends, what do they do? They fall asleep. And Jesus comes back to them a second time. And he gently reaches down and he touches them. Would you please watch and pray with me? And what do they do? Just like Elijah. Do you see the, the, the parallels here? A second time, the disciples, they, they fall asleep. Well, what does Jesus do? Does he throw in the towel? Does he say, all right, forget this? No, absolutely not. Jesus went to the cross of Calvary. Why did he do that? He did that so in 2021, the angel of the Lord can say to you and to me this morning, arise and eat. Oh, the grace of our God. It is so wonderful and it is so beautiful. Could it be this morning that you are sitting here and you are saying, why am I even here today? Why didn't God just destroy me a long time ago? You know why? That's God's amazing grace. And you could be here this morning living a life of sin that nobody knows about. You're really good at hiding your sin. The Bible says that he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. The way of the transgressor is hard. God is going to find a way to reveal that sin in his time. But how much better, my friend, would it be if God didn't have to use pain to reveal that sin, but you would just simply bow the knee and say, God, my heart is cold. My heart is far from you. I am drifting. I am enjoying the pleasures of this world more than the pleasures of God right now. Oh God, please forgive me. And God could be coming back to you a second time and saying, my child, arise and eat. You need strength because the journey in front of you is too great. That's what God does for Elijah. Look at verse number eight. Elijah gets the message the second time. He arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights on the Horeb, the Mount of God. Now that must have been some incredible meal, right? He, for 40 days and 40 nights, he goes with only eating one meal. How could he do that? Well, as a child, I remember reading this text and kind of wondering what was going on. But I realized there was a lot more going on because if you get your bible geography out and you look at your map you realize that from where the juniper tree was it was 180 miles to mount horeb now to someone like elijah who was used to walking everywhere they say that this journey from where elijah was under the juniper tree to mount horeb probably would have been a seven day journey so why does it take why did it take elijah 40 days and 40 nights to get to the to mount horeb well, why did it take Israel 40 years in the wilderness to get to the promised land? I mean, what's going on here? Elijah, he must have struggled on the way, along the way to Horeb. Was he still depressed? Was he still struggling to believe? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I know one thing. I know that there is a rich Savior and there is a poor sinner and they meet together at Horeb. That is what we know. And in order to get to Mount Horeb, God gave Elijah his strength for the entire journey. And whenever Elijah wandered off the path, God pulls him back and he says, Arise and eat, arise and eat, arise and eat, until he arrives at Mount Horeb where God wants him to be. How could God have so much patience with wanderers like Elijah? How could God have so much patience with wanderers like me? The answer is, because Jesus never wandered. You remember what Jesus told Mary and Joseph when he was 12 years old at the temple when they came to find him? They, he got lost in the crowd, remember? He didn't return home to Nazareth with everybody else. What did Jesus look at his mother and say? He said, don't you know, I must be about my father's business. You realize every step that Jesus took in his earthly ministry was never wasted. There was never one step taken in vain. He was always right there in the pathway of his father's eternal plan. He didn't miss one step. 
so he could have mercy on Elijah and people just like Elijah. You see, God sought him and he pursued him and he strengthened him and every step of his suffering was guided by the Father. He, the Father, Jesus Christ, when he was here on this earth, he never flinched, he never turned back, he never turned to the side and the Bible tells us knowing all the things that would come upon him, Jesus went forth through the desert, he was led to Gethsemane, from Gethsemane to the high priest, to Pilate, to Herod, back to Pilate again, and finally to the cross. Those three days that Jesus, or sorry, that, that day and a half that Jesus went from the Garden of Gethsemane till he finally arrived at the cross where he died for the sins of the world. You could trace his steps, and they say it was a journey of about seven miles, give or take a little bit. And during that entire trip that Jesus went from Herod to Pilate to Herod to Pilate, and he went through all of the Via Della Rosa carrying that cross, he never was one time out of the step of God's will. He never had to eat and he didn't have to drink for 20 hours. There was no arise and eat for Jesus. He never flinched so that Elijah's, with all of our wanderings, would still have the invitation to arise and eat and drink arise and eat where are you at this morning in your walk with god does it feel like a desert inside of you does it feel like your soul is asleep ladies and gentlemen if you know christ as your savior there is a savior who is pursuing you he is seeking you he is looking after you and he will strengthen you this time and next time and through his word this morning jesus says to you my child arise and eat and every time you open your bible he says to you arise and eat do you know why the devil is just so adamant that you don't spend time with god every day because if god's will for your life is a daily walk with him and life gets so busy that you can't read your bible and you can't pray you miss your feeding time you miss the time for god to speak to you and for your heart to be revived and drawn close to the savior my friend, God wants to know you and he wants to spend time with you. Are you willing to get on your knees and spend time with God? What does this passage teach us? Well, it teaches us a few things. It teaches us that we don't come to the Lord with anything in our hands. Elijah had nothing. He was in the wilderness all by himself. We don't come to God with our credentials. We don't say, hey God, I got a TS clearance, right? I got this, I got all of these things. God's not impressed with anything on your resume. We must come empty and we must come needy, completely dependent upon him. Because apart from Jesus Christ, we do not know how to take the next step. Say, so what do you mean? Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto, my, unto thy path. And so if you think that you can accomplish this journey apart from God, my friend, you are sadly mistaken. Next, the next step that you take must be looking to Jesus Christ. Do you know why? The journey that you have in front of you tomorrow is too great for you. 40 days, that's how long he was in the wilderness. That's too much for us, Lord. I can't go on one meal alone. And you know what God says to you? He says, my grace is sufficient for thee. I will help you day by day by day. So what is your big problem this morning? What is that thing that just will not go away? Are you this morning in the middle of a very difficult marriage? You know, that, that can be very hard. And it, it, it may be like you feel like you're all alone. Maybe you have a child this morning that's a prodigal. And you say, I just can't take it any longer. Yes, you can. His grace is sufficient for you. With the grace of God, day by day by day. Maybe you have this irritating stench in your life that needs to be solved. We have a mouse that died up in our attic. And we have a stench that is wafting into our house. And my wife is telling me I need to go up there and find it. And I'm putting it off as long as I can because I don't want to get covered in insulation, but I got to go, right? The stench is just overwhelming at this point. We got to find the source of the smell. And ladies and gentlemen, you may have a dead mouse, right? I know that's kind of a crass illustration. But you have that dead mouse that dies and it doesn't begin to stink for a while, but eventually it gets to the point where somebody kicks you and says, you got to go now and find the source of that smell. And that thing that kicks you, the person that kicks you, it's not your wife, it's the Holy Spirit. And he says, it's time to get right with me. What is your big problem today keeping you from God? What is the stench in your life? You say, I can't go on. 
Yes, you can. Here's why. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 13. You've got to memorize this verse as a believer. You've got to have this memorized. There hath no temptation taken you, but as such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer. The word suffer there means to allow. God will not allow you to be tempted above that which ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way that ye may be able to bear it. What is the way of escape? His name is Jesus, the angel of the Lord, who is following you and is pursuing you and is strengthening you. It's the angel who comes to you again in his grace and again and again and again, all the way to Mount Horeb. Jesus brings you to where you need to be. And then when you get there, here's God's grace. He doesn't leave you there, but he teaches you a lesson. And at Mount Horeb, God will meet with Elijah and he will straighten out the mess that Elijah's made with his life. And Lord willing, we'll see that together next time we're in our text. And we're going to see how God wonderfully deals with Elijah and solves his problems. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind you this morning that God knows how to fix the greatest problems that we have in our life. So can I close by asking this question this morning? Can you say with all of your heart, transparency between you and God, that even though I have all types of shortcomings in my life, and even though I find myself under the juniper trees time and time and time again, I love the grace of God. Can you say that this morning, that you love God's grace? Can you say this morning that the grace that seeks me and pursues me and strengthens me, I owe everything to that grace. Because ladies and gentlemen, God will get the most honor from your life when you simply sit at his table and feast on his word. Feasting on the riches of his grace. There's a song that we sing that talks about that. Feasting on the riches of his grace. Resting neath his sheltering wing. Always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The sweetest name I know. He fills my every longing. He keeps me singing as I go. Is that the song of your heart this morning? If not, bring your burden, bring your problem, bring your barren, lazy soul to God, and you will find rest. And the Savior says to you today, arise and eat. Father, I know not the spiritual condition of the souls of people here in this room, but I do know my heart. And Lord, I'm prone to wander. And Lord, there are many times that you bring me back to the point where I need to feast on your grace. And if there's someone here this morning, Lord, that's far from you, oh, I pray that today that they would not leave this room the same way they came in, with cold hearts, with a heart that is back on track with the Savior, that is feasting on the riches of your grace. This morning, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if God's spoken to your heart, can I encourage you to make your seat a personal place of prayer with God right now? Pour your heart out to the Savior. Ask Him to forgive you for your wandering without Him. Thank Him for pursuing you by His grace. And ask Him to give you the strength that you need to finish the journey today. Day by day by day.
we thank you this morning that day by day, your strength is there. We will fail many, many times, even in a day, Lord. We find ourselves sitting under the juniper trees of self-pity, wallowing in our sorrow, overcome by circumstances. But Lord, may we remember that your grace is sufficient for us. We thank you, Lord, for your amazing, bountiful, plentiful grace that strengthens us for the journey. We love you. Amen. Hi, Pastor Barney Schwenke here with you again. Thank you so much for watching uh, the video today and taking time out of your schedule to listen to the Word of God being taught. My prayer is that this message will truly help you in your walk with the Lord. I tell our church family all the time, God's will for your life is a daily walk with Him. So if you have a Bible, make sure you read it. If you don't have a Bible, reach out to us here on our website and uh, we will make sure we send one to you. We want to do everything we can to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. If you found the message today to be a blessing and you have the means financially to be able to help us, we definitely would encourage you to do so. It costs money to be able to produce these videos and to be able to put these out there on the internet for you. You can go to our website, faithwaybaptistchurch.com, and in the upper right-hand corner, you can click the word give, and uh, there you can make a donation to the media ministry of our church if you so choose. But hey, we do this for you. We want to be a blessing. And so thank you again for joining us today. Like we said, if there's any way we could be a help or a blessing to you or your family, the contact information is there on our website. Please let us know. We'd love to be able to help you in your walk with Jesus Christ. Have a great day.